the outlook for the next few months, I think, is liquidity tailwinds, and it will continue to mean that risk assets, it's kind of hard for them to go down. It's not necessarily like, you know, they can't go down. Of course, they can go down if something happens, but you have this kind of like support. Um, and with that support, it's kind of hard for them to to really sell off a huge amount, and, and they'll just grind higher. Uh as I say, I think the biggest risk, like it's not black swan, of course, um, it's known, unknown, but inflation coming back. Um, and I think that that might take the second half of the year before you've got chance of seeing that. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Wall Street was extremely pessimistic heading into 2023 and the year surprised to the upside. Here at the end of the year, markets are now brimming with optimism and the S&P is trading at an all-time high. So is the momentum likely to continue? Or will 2024 be another surprise year for investors, but this time to the downside? For an analyst perspective, we turn to Simon White, macro strategist at Bloomberg and co-founder of the investment advisory firm Variant Perception. Simon, thanks so much for joining us today, all the way from Scotland. Uh, yeah, yeah, all the way fresh from Scotland, but even with a, a genuine Scottish accent as well. <laughs> all right. Well, I love it. Um, Simon, I have read your work now um, for at least a year and a half and wanted to interview you. And it has taken me a long time uh, to be able to figure out how to make that happen. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the program here. I'm very excited for this. Um, you write great analysis. Um, you create a lot of great charts, some of which you've already prepared for the audience here. Can't wait to walk through them with you. Um, very quickly, before we get into the details, um, let me just start with the general question I like to kick these discussions off with. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question to begin with. And as you say, you know, very broad, but um, where we are today, uh, I think is, is very interesting, partly because we are still kind of coming out of the the ripple effects from the pandemic. And that's obviously just thrown all kind of standard analysis really out the window. It hasn't necessarily turned it upside down, um, but it has pushed things very much out of sync. So there's a, a, an analogy used, um, the bullwhip effect, um, to talk about consumers, but you can use that thinking about that more broadly. You know, we have had uh, a number of cycles uh, coming out of the pandemic. And if you think of them, like different um, whips, if you like, different bull whips, um, they are out of sync. And I think that has thrown a lot of standard analysis um, out of the window. It's made a recession uh, look like it's imminent <clears throat> for you know a long time now. And obviously, we're, we're still really not there, certainly when it comes to an NBER recession. Um, I think there's other ways you can obviously talk about a recession, but I think you have to be very clear about what you mean you know, and well-defined. And I think the NBER are a good referee. Um, and I think also at the same time, we have had very favorable liquidity conditions. And so you kind of had these two almost contradictory things that I think have led to um, a lot of confusion uh, in markets. You know, economies and markets do not always operate uh, in the same cycle. And they don't always necessarily do what you think they might do. Just because the economy is bad <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean the markets are in bad shape. And vice versa, just because the economy is doing well, uh, it doesn't mean that you know you're going to have necessarily um, you know good markets. So we've had a lot of kind of um, ripple effects that are operating out of sync, um, and I think that's left, um, as I say, a lot of predictions kind of by the my, myself included, my, my my predictions included. Um, you know, I think recession has looked uh, imminent for a, a heck of a long time and hasn't arrived. So we've had kind of recession illusion. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons for that really is that you've had the goods and the service economy have um, operated out of sync since coming out of the pandemic. So we had uh, a goods, uh, very strong goods recovery was the first part of the economy to recover out of the pandemic. Uh, but then it began to decline, but from a very high level. Um, and at the same time, you have the services economy was gradually improving and uh well, we've had what looks like a you know decline in goods from a very high level, and services have continued to rise. We have not had goods and services economies at the same time contracting, and that's generally what you need to see to have a full blown recession. So, what has kind of thrown traditional analysis out the window 
Is it traditional leading indicators such as, um, you know, the LEI, the conference boards, LEI, for instance, are strongly correlated to the, uh, the goods economy? Um, and so in that sense, they've kind of been right because we have had a goods recession. But because the service economy um, has been gradually improving the whole time, um, it's never collapsed at the same time. And we just haven't had the two sides of the economy contracting at the same time and we haven't had the recession. So that's um, that's where we are today. We can get into obviously what the forward looking stuff is, you know, in, in the discussion. But that's kind of where we're left today. And I think that's why the real sort of main driver of why things have been uh, kind of difficult to put your finger on uh, for the last two years. OK, great. Yeah, I do want to go into the details of, of uh, each of those issues and where you see them headed. Um, first, let me just ask. So um, very familiar with the bullwhip effect, um, actually have have put out videos trying to explain it uh, for people. Um, uh, and, and they can be highly disruptive, actually, even even in normal times. Um, uh, but we had the pandemic come and really just, you know, shake the whole global economy, scramble everything. Um, you, you, you said that uh, we're still recovering from that. Where? Two questions. One, where are we in that recovery? Like, are we now mostly recovered? Um, and are we are we recovering back to a sense of normalcy where the old rules will continue to apply? Or has anything been sort of permanently changed by the unprecedented nature of everything we went through over the past couple of years? I think the, the second part of your question, I think it's, it's too early to tell. Um, you know, will we revert to normal cycles that um, kind of operate in, in the way that they have in the past? I think I think it's too early to tell. As far as like, you know, are we at sense of, you know, how how, how much of the recovery is, is taking place already? Um, I think things will still continue to operate perhaps out of sync for a little bit longer. Uh, so we have, you know, recession risk, um, I think, you know, certainly up until a few months ago, it was quite, you know, it looked very imminent that we were going to get a recession. Um, and then if you actually look at the, uh, again, I, I, I stick to the NBER because if you look at GDI, you could say we've already had a recession. If you look at manufacturing, mm -hmm. we've already had a recession. You could look at earnings. Um, and, you know, I think the two quarters of, you know, consecutive uh, decline in GDP, I think that's too simplistic. Um, so that's why, you know, I stick to the NBER. Now they they don't tell you exactly how they you know call a recession, um, but they do tell you some of the the main indicators. You know, there's four things they look at: they look at payrolls, they look at real PCE, they look at industrial production, and they look at real personal income less transfer payments. Um, and actually, I think that's one of the charts. Um, if on the slides that we've got there, we can we can look at, which is on um, I think it's slide number. Seven. Yeah. So the, the chart on the left there. So, you know, for the NVER to call a recession, um, if you look historically, all four of these indicators have been in contraction at the same time. Um, the only exception was was 2001. Um, and that's when you didn't have uh, real PCE was, was not contracting, but the other three were. And if you look at where we are today, so the chart on the right kind of zooms in um, to where we are today. Um, and you can see there, you know, you have the non-farm payrolls. So job growth has been getting, it's, the job market has been slowing um, and it's been slowing gradually. So slowing from a high level. And you can see that that's still above um, contraction. And that in fact, if you look at leading indicators of payrolls, for instance, claims, Claims is actually a very good shorter term leading indicator for payrolls. So that's inflected higher again. So, you know, all the things that I was looking at was kind of the trajectory was heading one direction. So you were expecting to see a much worse job market much quicker. But we've had this kind of like, you know, the rugs been taken from beneath your feet. Um, and some indicators like claims have started to inflect higher. Um, so that's really sort of suggesting that the any sort of NBER recession has been delayed, not put off indefinitely of course you know the last person to say you know the end of boom and bust or one of the last people was gordon brown and he was proven magnificently wrong mm -hmm. um so you know i, I don't know you premature and think this is uh, there's no recession coming a recession will come but it looks like it's been delayed and if you look at the bottom half of the second chart 
you know, you can see that, uh, you know, IP is kind of bumping around zero. So industrial production is kind of bumping around zero. Uh, whereas real personal income, uh, you know, is still above zero. In fact, it's, if anything, it might even be inflecting slightly higher. I mean, real wage growth is, is okay. It's not as high as it was, uh, but it's still positive. So, you know, wages are still growing in real terms. And in fact, if you look at some survey data, uh, for instance, the NFIB compensation plans has just inflected higher. If you look at a lot of the Fed uh, survey wage data, they, these things lead to wages, you know, by three to six months. They've started to inflect higher. So it's very hard to fashion an argument uh, that says we're going to get an NBER recession, um, you know, very soon. And, and this is not all academic, by the way, that, you know, the NBER, the problem with the NBER or any sort of recession dating body is that they will always date recession after the fact. Um, but if we look at, as I say, leading indicators for all these indicators that the NBER look at, where it be jobs or we look at uh, income or even industrial production, the leading indicators for these are actually in, inflecting higher right now. And these lead, as I say, with a three to six month lead. So it's not like there's any imminent sign that they're going to suddenly turn down. That, by the way, is tend to what tends to be what happens in recessions. Things do move very fast. But there's nothing in these very reliable leading indicators that suggest that's going to happen. Um, certainly not in the next three to six months. So, you know, the recession risk has receded for now. But there is still recession risk. And I think that's going to come from, um, and that's the next slide, uh, it's going to come from the slow impact of rising rates. So the first thing to say is, you know, the, the actual debt, um, you know, DSRs or uh, the debt service ratios are actually not as high as, again, people might think. You know, we've just had this massive, uh, you know, very fast interest rate rise from the Fed, right? Over 500 basis points in quite a short space of time. Um, but the real, I guess, the game changer, because the biggest part of um, uh, kind of uh, certainly household debt levels is mortgages. Um, and because you have uh, so many people on longer duration fixed rates, um, that's really shielded them in, in, in quite a big way from, from the kind of like the shop window mortgage rates. Shop window mortgage rates were up at 8%. They're maybe back down about seven now. Um, but the kind of effective rate is more like three and a half, and that's only climbing quite slowly. Um, so well, you know, the chart on the left there, you can see the consumption debt service ratio has risen, and that's higher than it was pre-pandemic. The uh, the white line, which is the mortgage one, is still lower. And that means that the total one, which is the blue line, is about roughly the same as where it was pre-pandemic. Um, so, you know, the overall kind of pain, if you like, right now, here and now, broadly speaking, there are obviously individual pockets of pain for sure. But on the aggregate level, it's just not there. It's not where you'd expect it to be. Um, and a huge part of this, there's two big things, is the government running the largest peacetime non-recessionary deficit that it ever has. That's one big thing. And the second thing is, you know, despite the Fed, you know, doing QT and it's up to $95 billion a month, um, it still has over $7 trillion of assets. So $7 trillion of duration risk on its balance sheet. And that has an enormous uh, shielding impact on the economy that it, certainly I didn't appreciate at the very beginning of last year. And I was a lot more negative and I thought a recession was a lot more imminent. But again, I was you know, using traditional leading indicators, which have an excellent track record, but at that time, maybe not fully appreciating just how out of sync the economy uh, was coming out of uh, coming out of the pandemic. But this, this will change. You know, we're not going to get a free pass forever. Um, so, you know, for instance, you know, corporates have also benefited um, or not benefited. Well, in fact, they have on net benefit so far from higher rates because they've been quite kind of deft in their in their in their way that they have, uh, if you like, uh, managed their duration risk. They uh, were essentially increasing their duration risk when rates were were very, very low, you know, at the very you know, before the Fed started to raise them. And then you start to re reduce duration risk um, when rates start to rise. And they also increased their um, exposure to short-term uh, like money market funds and bills um, where rates had, were obviously rising. You know, rates were up at over 5%. Um, so their net interest income was actually rising. But that will, that's changing. So the chart on the right there shows that, you know, as sort of next year goes on, um, that, that's likely to change. That white line is likely to start inflecting higher. So the kind of free pass, if you like, so 
households have had a kind of free pass or they've been shielded from uh, mortgage rates. But that effective rate is creeping up. You know, there are still 25% of people on arms, you know, adjustable uh, reset mortgages. So they will gradually uh, have to fix at higher rates. And that's why the effective rate is moving. And corporates will gradually have to pay more interest. So as that uh, process continues to take place, you know, recession risk, you know, will rise. But I think that's very much the second half of the year thing at the earliest. All right. Um, so you're basically saying um, we had a, we had a guest on this program uh, two weeks ago, Wolf Richter, who sort of made the comment, um, hey, I, I think we I would like for us to have a recession because we I, I think we deserve one. And I think there's a lot of sort of, you know, malinvestment that needs to sort of be cleared out. And he said, looking at the data, I just don't see one happening anytime soon. I kind of hear you saying a similar story as that, um, but saying, hey, you do think that over time, the lag effect is going to catch up with this economy. Um, this chart here on the right, the corporate's interest payment ones, I know that's a real head scratcher for folks, right? <laughs> because you're like, oh my God, we've had this tremendous increase in the cost of debt. And yet the net interest payments is going down uh, on average across uh, corporate's uh, in income statements. Um, to your prediction here that um, eventually that's going to that's going to reverse. Given your current calculation of the maturity wall that lies ahead from here, um, when do you expect that to reverse and to start to matter? I think I just heard you say that's going to be a story of the second half of twenty twenty four. Is that kind of when you're beginning to expect that to bite? Yeah, I mean it's it's not an exact science. Um, you know, obviously that chart there you can see. So the, the blue line, just to be clear, has been pushed forward already. And there, I pushed it forward by a year. Um, but, it, you know, it's not exact science. But when I look at something like that, that tells me it's probably not an imminent leading relationship. Like, it's not something in the next few months. It's probably like 6 to 12. Um, and that's obviously just historically how long it's taken for, you know, these higher interest rates to really feed through um, and have that sort of negative, negative impact. Um, I think the impact to households is, is slower. It seems to be, you know, obviously after the financial crisis, I think during the financial crisis, arms were like more than 50% of mortgages. And there was a huge reduction in that in the years following the financial crisis. They, and then it bottomed um, maybe a few years ago. And as I say, it's back up at 25% now. But that really sort of is a is a very kind of um, effective break, if you like, of, of stopping that transmission mechanism. And, that, and that's really the, the overall message here is that the transmission mechanism um, from higher rates through things like adjustable rate mortgages, through corporates being savvy with their managing their interest rate risk. Also, of course, banks, and, and they have this time, you look at banks, net interest margins, they've risen as they tend to when rates rise. Throw in the fact that the Fed is warehousing $7 trillion of you know duration risk. And then the cherry in the cake is that the government's spending you know, $2 trillion X-ish a year. Um, all these things are really mitigating what otherwise would have caused a lot of damage. Um, and then, as I say, throwing into the confusion uh, is the fact that everything is out of sync coming out of the pandemic. You know, all, all, all different parts of the economy are kind of operating at different speeds. Um, and and because they're asynchronous, as I say, it's causing a lot of hitherto sort of reliable relationships um, <clears throat> not to operate in the way that you'd expect them to. And as I say, when it comes to assets, this is the other side of this thing, right? is you have this kind of confusing backdrop that you know could look quite negative um but you also have extremely buoyant liquidity conditions so uh one of the most useful and i mean useful in the terms of the way that it, it has a, a leading effect or sorry as a leading relationship with asset prices which kind of like really if you're looking at this stuff you know and you're an investor it's really that's what matters to you most right you can pontificate about the economy to the cows come home but really what you're interested in is what does it mean for assets? And that's why excess liquidity, which is the difference between real money growth and uh, economic growth, um, is, is so useful. And it's quite an intuitive kind of indicator because you know money is created by banks and central banks. And what isn't used up by the needs of the real economy is, you know, quote unquote, excess. And that excess liquidity tends to find its way into risk assets. And if you look back in March, you know, things were pretty negative back then. But what really ha happened then was an inflection higher in excess liquidity. <clears throat> you had a combination of things. You had money growth 
okay, it wasn't rising particularly, but it stopped falling um, because the central banks had been tightening. Um, uh, But growth was quite slow. Growth was relatively slow. And on top of that, the dollar had been weakening. Um, And because excess liquidity, global excess liquidity is in dollar terms, that weakening in the dollar boosted excess liquidity. So I don't, I think that's kind of underappreciated how important it was um, the dollar weakening this year to really help uh, excess liquidity and therefore really help the risk asset rally that we've had for most of the year. But kind of it was con- counterintuitive. Excess liquidity tends to be rising when people are most pessimistic. So there's, there's something inherently contrarian about the indicator as well, which is kind of great from a market's perspective. You know, markets tend to have their, their their biggest moves when people least expect it, right? Um, people tend to extrapolate linearly. Uh, then the market turns and does something that no one else really expects. Um, and that's, as I say, when you tend to have the, the biggest moves uh, in markets. So that, that liquidity situation has been very favorable. <clears throat> and it's been really another dynamic this year, which is uh, unique. We haven't had this before. Um, is the fact that we've had a fiscal, huge fiscal deficit. Now, that would normally be quite problematic for liquidity because you essentially have, not to go into too much detail, but you have a huge number of treasuries that essentially crowd out other assets and they essentially crowd out liquidity. Um, but because um, the treasury um, decided to skew issuance to bills, so this is essentially like you know, people talk about the Powell pivot. This was the Yellen pivot. And this happened, uh, you know, really the beginning of this year. So the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, the Treasury decided to skew its issuance hugely towards bills. So most of its actual borrowing was done um, in bills. <clears throat> and this enabled the idle liquidity that was sat in the Fed's reverse repo facility to essentially mitigate the loss of liquidity that would otherwise happen if you're trying to issue so many, so many Treasuries. So by issuing bills, it allowed the money market funds, mainly money market funds, to intermediate in this uh, borrowing. Um, and you get the best of both worlds. You, normally, you would get fiscal you know, deficits great because it's good for the economy, but it would have problems for, as I say, for liquidity, and that's not great for risk assets necessarily. But this time around, we got the economic boost of a fiscal deficit, and there was no impact to uh, liquidity. Reserves, central bank reserves actually rose. And this is despite the fact the Fed's doing QT. So if you look at reserves, they're actually higher now um, than when the Fed uh, started QT in June 2022. So this is like a fiscal deficit on speed. Um, you know, it's, it's a complete best of all worlds um, for risk assets. And again, if it's a very different dynamic. So if you're, if you're not really following what's happening, um, it's not obvious. People will try and attach narratives to why such and such is happening to, to markets. But really what drives markets is liquidity. Um, and as I say, you've had positive excess liquidity. And this time around, you've had this extra dynamic of uh, central bank liquidity being supported by the Treasury's actions. All right. Let, let me just interject for a second. So first off, um, the video preceding this one, Simon, um, was with Michael Howell. And we did a deep dive into liquidity because that's really his area of, of uh, specialization. And uh, at least some of the folks watching this you know, have been introduced to that reality that you just mentioned, which is despite the fact that we are in a, had been in a tight, an aggressive rate hike regime with many of the the major central banks in the world and the Fed's done over a trillion in QT. And the narrative is that, oh, okay, well, we're draining the pond here. Um, that's not the case. In fact, liquidity has been rising pretty much ever since um, October of, of 2022. And of course, that's when the stock market bottomed and then we had a great year in the markets this year. And, and lo and behold, you know, the the very direct correlation between net liquidity and asset prices is, is holding here, right? So looking through that lens, as you're saying, you're not terribly surprised. Now you're saying it's it's not just sort of the standard form of liquidity, it's kind of like li- liquidity plus or QE plus, uh, the way that it's happening for the, the, the reasons that you mentioned. And, and one thing I just wanna make sure that folks understand, um, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more is, this isn't just sort of your regular liquidity stuff. Like th- this is an orchestrated back and forth, handing of the baton back and forth between the Fed and the U.S. Treasury. And Treasury obviously is run by Janet Yellen, who had the the head of the Fed job uh, before Jerome Powell. So, do we really indeed have this sort of 
coordinated, synchronized plan here where sort of the, the Fed was relying on the Treasury uh, to provide liquidity um, while the Fed was going through its tightening and hiking regimes. And then and then now the, the baton is being held, handed back to the Fed to say, hey, now that perhaps because um, uh, interest on the national debt is is now in the process of raising so much and that's that's really beginning to bite uh, our budget. All right, Powell, now you get to start bringing rates down to to mitigate against that. Um, is, is, did I describe it correctly how, in terms of how you look at it? Yeah, I mean, that, that that's exactly it. I mean, um, the way, I mean, f first of all, well, very first of all, I, I guess I wouldn't describe it as, as sort of QE plus. I think, I think that to sort of use that term creates a lot of confusion because QE plus, they're actually buying assets. We know they're not. And their balance sheet would actually be expanding. It, it isn't. Okay. Um, but let's but say net positive liquidity plus. There is, there is, there is the high powered liquidity that tends to or can you know support risk asset markets is rising and not falling, um, and that's the critical thing here. The second thing in terms of um, coordination between, if you like, between fiscal and the monetary. Now, <clears throat> we'll never know, of course, um, because obviously central banks officially are still independent. But historically, if you look at central banking. Um, for most of its existence, it's never been independent. You know, it's essentially been an arm of the state. And central bank independence is only a, a sort of relatively recent phenomenon. Um, and now if you're a central banker, you might argue that, you know, central banking independence over the last 20, 30 years, roughly, you know, that's why we've had lower inflation. You know, central banks have had inflation targets. They've done their job very well. We've had, you know, low inflation, the, the so-called nice decades, you know, non-inflationary continuous expansion. Uh, but now things have changed. Um, you know, we, we've now, for the first time in decades, we've had, you know, very high inflation. Um, and I, I think, you know, we can get into this as well um, later on if we have time. But, you know, I think inflation will, will return. I think it's way too early to sound it all clear on inflation. I think we're in, you know, an inflation regime. This cycle is going to be extremely different and last probably a lot longer than than many people think. Um, but the, the, the existence of inflation, it's, now it's back. That means de facto central bank independence is kind of over. I mean, it'll, it'll continue in name, um, but it's already happening. I mean, you know, you, you you can't have a government running, you know, that big a fiscal deficit outside a recession, and still have uh, independent central banks. Um, you know, you can't have you know three hundred, oh, sorry, seven three quarters of a trillion up to a trillion uh, money sitting in the treasury's account uh, at the Fed and still have. Uh, central bank independence. So already the lines are becoming blurred. It will never be kind of made explicit. Um, and when it comes to, you know, I mentioned what I called the Yellen pivot earlier on, you know, that that made, uh, if you like, Powell's job a lot easier. Now, whether it's coordinated or not, you know, sometimes you don't even need to have be told what to do. You just know what the right thing is to do. Um, and I'm sure someone smart at the Treasury knew that they could take advantage of this um, idle liquidity sitting in the RRP and the way to do it was to issue lots of bills because then we could have uh, rates still up at five and a half percent, but not crash the market. <clears throat> and we know that neither uh, the Treasury or the Fed, you know, really want to do that no matter what they say. Um, so great, fantastic. But uh, as you alluded to, the problem is now you now have this massive uh, government issuance, which is going to lead to, or already is, a huge interest rate expense bill. Now, I remember looking at this thinking, well, that can't be a major problem. But the actual numbers are, are are quite crazy. I mean, already it's around about 3% of total debt outstanding. Um, you can basically just use, for, by the way, just use the 10-year as a proxy for how much the government has to pay on its interest rate bill. Obviously, the 10-year over the last you know several months has risen quite a lot. Um, and if you look, and it leads that interest rate bill by about six months. And so therefore, the expected interest rate bill next year is going to be something in the region of 45 to 5%, which is about, in number terms, about the GDP of Spain. Wow. Um, and that's an annual number, right? And and the problem with that, of course, you have to bo borrow more to pay your interest bill. Um, so first of all, that's not great for the national debt that you're having to borrow more just to pay to pay interest. But when it comes more immediately, when it comes to liquidity, so that very uh, conducive backdrop I was talking about with the Yellen pivot, um, that they were able to basically run this fiscal deficit and keep reserves supported, uh, e even while QT was ongoing. In fact, reserves were rising. And so we had the everything rally. Um, but that weight, that gravity, if you like, from these this interest rate expense 
would gradually really start to to suck uh, reserves. Now, in, in two ways, it would um, limit their velocity, and it would also potentially reduce the amount in the system. And historically, that that's what you've seen, right? When interest rate expense rises, government's interest rate expense rises, reserves uh, tend to fall. Um, and as I say, even if they don't fall, their velocity will tend to 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 fall. And the reason is, is that governments, um, you know, taxes are essentially paid from bank deposits, and then they're paid to people that hold government debt. Um, and the general thinking is that that's not a problem because, you know, the people that own that debt then spend that interest, so it should be kind of circular. But if you look at who holds uh, U.S. Treasuries, the only real holders that are likely to spend in the economy, if you like, are households and corporates. But they're only 10% roughly of treasuries outstanding. And even then, you know, they're, they're unlikely to spend all of their interest payments. 90% uh, of treasuries are held by financials and by foreigners. Um, now, financials are more likely to reinvest it. Again, some could be spent, but, you know, when we're looking at the numbers here, you can see that there's a high chance that um, a lot of that interest income is going to be reinvested. And even if it's reinvested, you're, it, the propensity it has to be held by someone who's likely to spend it uh, becomes less. So the more it filters through the economy, the more it filters through to the people that are less likely to spend and more likely to save. So you that interest income becomes less stimulatory um, and it becomes more likely to be held as savings. And therefore, the velocity of the reserves, if you like, you know, the bank deposits, whatever you want to call it, but the, the bank deposits and the reserves are obviously related to one another, um, declines. Uh, or outright, you could see a decline in reserves purely because uh, some of the reinvested income ends up at the back of the RRP, assuming at some point the RRP becomes more attractive than bills, which is quite possible because front-end rates are already falling. The Fed has pivoted. And also because at some point, you know, Treasury, uh, Yellen will probably, you know, renege somewhat from her pivot because right now they're they're issuing, you know, bills hand over fist. So, you know, bills, uh, bill rates would, would be like to fall. So you've kind of had like, you know, maybe Yellen did Powell a favor by, you know, issuing bills. And now we've had the reverse, you know, Powell has now done Treasury a favor by trying to reduce its interest rate bills. So they've kind of tried to buy more time. Uh, into next year to to keep the to keep the game going a little bit longer. Right. Although although Powell has suggested he's going to help by bringing rates down, and he hasn't actually cut rates yet. And yeah. and one well, question yeah. I one question I have with with a, with this liquidity um, is the the more that we um, push liquidity into the system, and the more that we create a wealth effect, which is definitely going on right now with the markets. Right. They're in full party mode now. Um, you know, spending goes up. Uh, we, we've got this momentum of, of workers starting to demand higher wages as well. We'll see what, what happens with that. But um, my point is, is, uh, is that inflationary? And does that actually potentially hinder Powell's true ability to bring rates down as much as he'd like to, because all of a sudden inflation starts coming back? Very, very good question. Um, I think they have significantly increased inflation risks. It will obviously take some time uh, to filter through, but <clears throat> analogies obviously can be quite lazy. But I think to look at the 70s or even the 40s, everything, uh, nothing will be exactly the same. But the one thing that is immutable to everything you look at in financial history or any history it is human behavior. Um, and I think that what happened in the 70s um, could be repeated to some extent this time around, because in the 70s, you had the same kind of conditions that created inflation in the first place. You know, you had a central bank that could, thought it could ease more than it could. We had average inflation targeting and all that sort of stuff. So you had like the a priori conditions for high inflation. And then you had some quote unquote bad luck. In the 70s, it was, well, the Nixon closed the gold window. So the Fed can't control that. Uh, then you had the Yom Kippur War. And then at the end of the decade, you had the Iranian Revolution. This time around, you know, we had, uh, you know, the pandemic, which obviously didn't help. And then we had the Ukraine uh, war as well, which also didn't help. And they're kind of like, they, they would often, they would cause inflation on their own. But because we already had the a priori conditions, like the kindling, it, to some extent, just needed to be lit. And it got lit. Um, but what happened in the 70s is we had a recession. 
um, and essentially the, the Fed cut. And it was the, you know, what I call the premature all clear. So the second act of the inflation play, it was a three act play. And the second act was the premature all clear where they cut rates. Um, but then what they, what happened is that inflation made a, a higher low and then start to climb again. And I, what I, I'm looking at right now, people, you know, it seems to be, most people seem to think this is like Goldman called it the last mile of disinflation um, and, and things like that. There seems to be the general consensus is that inflation is kind of done. It will head back to sort of maybe two and a half. Um, and that's kind of really it. And it's unlikely to, to re-accelerate. But I think uh, you look at a number of things that are already beginning to turn up. Um, simplistically, I'll give you one example. You can separate all the components of inflation, U.S. inflation, this is into structural and cyclical components. So the structural components um, are ones that are persistently above their long-term average, and the cyclical ones are anything that isn't that doesn't conform to that. And almost all of the decline in headline inflation has been driven by a decline in the cyclical components. The structural stuff has remained uh, elevated; it's fallen a little bit. But what's happening now? is the cyclical has probably stopped falling. It might fall a little bit more. The structural is still elevated, but the structural still start, it started to turn up again. So we're starting to see a rise in the structural. Um, and the cyclical's fallen so far that, and as its name would suggest, it's cyclical. So the cyclical will start to turn up, driven by things like you know gas prices or whatever, whatever it might be. And then they'll start reinforcing one another again. And so you'll see this similar dynamic where inflation might fall a bit further, but then it will start to pick up again. And to be clear, I'm not saying we're going to get new highs. You know, we're not going to necessarily eclipse like 9% again in headline, but it's going to be enough that it's going to cause alarm and it's going to upset people um, because they're not expecting it. You know, and as I said, the CPI fixing swap market, which is your kind of like your actual tradable way of sort of knowing what the market expects um, is looking at inflation going back, you know, roughly two and a half within a year's time. Um, so I think I think people are going to be unseated by by this reacceleration inflation and the market is just completely not priced for it okay and and right there you're talking about you know monetary inflation or 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 you know um capital flows uh, driven inflation but the week we're talking here um uh uh rebels in the red sea um have just started attacking um you know shipping lanes there through the suez canal and all of a sudden, you know, global shipping, 12% of global uh, transport goes through the Suez Canal. That's all now being redirected. We don't know how long it's going to last for, whether the situation might even get worse from here. You know, who knows? But all we know is that if they're getting redirected around Africa, um, that adds, I think, like a 40% more in terms of time and costs and, you know, uh, oil burned and all that stuff. Uh to the price of getting something that used to you know, be shipped through that route, right? So that's inflationary, right? How inflationary it's gonna be, we don't know. My point is just as there are sort of wild cards in this game that can add to that, that the Fed has zero control over. Well, if you, if you go, actually on slide five, um, you just reminded me I had a chart. So two charts there, for instance, that tell you things are now reversing. We've maybe seen the most of the disinflationary kind of trend. So the chart on the left side of um, slide five shows wages. Um, and wages leading indicators, that's just one example, um, have started to to rise again. Um, and that's uh, corroborated, as I mentioned earlier, by the NFIB compensation plans, which also leads wages. That has started to pick up again. And then re relating directly to your Red Sea point, which I mentioned on the slide, funnily enough, as supp the supply chain index uh, started to pick up um, a while ago. So obviously it, it collapsed. Um, but now, uh, as everything does, you know, especially after a large collapse, we, we expect to see some sort of uh, bounce. So we're seeing a bounce in supply chain index, which suggests um, that, you know, we're again, we're past the peak um, advan like disinflationary advantage we've had from supply chain. Um, and then all it takes, like something like the Red Sea, I mean, we know that, you know, supply chains are more fragile and more brittle now because of the geopolitical situation. And again, this, the 70s was kind of similar in that extent as well, that, that we had a lot more geopolitical uncertainty. So if you already have like the, the a priority, the, the, the sort of remote cause, if you like, of um, bad inflation conditions, it just takes, as I say, bad luck, whatever you want to call it, but unexpected things to happen. And all of a sudden, 
you know, something that in on its own, say, 15 years ago, may not have been particularly inflationary, um, or if it was, it would have been very briefly inflationary, now has the capacity to be considerably more inflationary and cause um, a lot more issues. So uh, to, to think that the, you know, the all clear has been sounded, I think is way too premature on inflation. And what the Fed has just done, I think, is just, you know, doubled that down. Um, if they have just, as you said, given a green light to, you know, the wealth effect, animal spirits, um, you know, huge inflows into into equities, um, uh, all the kind of things that they said they had problems with before, like, you know, financial conditions being too loose. Well, they're just going to get even looser. Uh, all these things uh, raise the risk, significantly raise the risk for inflation. So I think that's something that happens uh, probably as early as I say later in, in next year and, and something that the market really is not priced for at all. Okay. And, and what's your level of concern that, that we do start hitting those lag effects due to the higher rates that we have had for the past two years, um, right at the time that inflation might be really starting to bite again. And so right at the time the Fed needs to use its tools to bring rates down, it can't. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, so the, I guess the question is, does the Fed uh, cut rates uh, this year? Well, get, given how the market's kind of gunning for a March cut, um, 80%, I mean, the, the, lower, the you know, the Fed has already tried to disabuse the market of that. It's been too premature, but it shows you the direction we're going in, right? Um, and and uh, the reaction function to the Fed has changed. So I would have said to you initially, before what happened last week, uh, you know, we're going to get the next move will be a hike. But now I think it's clear, as I say, there's another agenda, there's another reaction function. So I think that they could push for a cut sooner than uh, than other things would justify. Um, and that may come before really it's clear that inflation is picking up. And then they're in a bit of a quandary. Um, you know, they they because they, they really have taken a gamble that inflation is is kind of like it's done. I mean, unless they're just being gung ho or you know what, the, the interest rate bill is a biggest risk, is a bigger risk for us. I can't imagine that, but with, uh, with, with, that's what I wanted to ask, which is um, asking for your gut feel here, right? We don't know. We're speculating. Is it that they, as Powell seemed to intimate, we're winning this war. We're not going to declare the victory just yet, but we can see the beginning of the end here. We don't want to wait until we get down to 2% uh, to, to start cutting because then the lag effect would drag us substantially below our inflation target. We got to start cutting at some point above 2%. We think we're getting close to that point. And it's very much like, yeah, we're just kind of wrapping this up now. Is it more that in their mind, do you think? Or as some are asking, is the Fed really worried about something that it's not telling us about? Now, it could be the, they could be worried about the budget, uh, you know, the, the cost of the, uh, the interest service uh, on the debt. I don't know. It doesn't sound like you think that's a big enough bugbear for them. But could there be something they see on the horizon that does worry them, and they're thinking, you know, we got to get ahead of this thing? Yeah, well, it's, uh, to be clear, I, th I think I think it could well be the interest burden. I, I think that that okay. is enough on its own to have perhaps influenced them um, to to act. Because again, it's it's so abrupt. I, I don't. I've never subscribed to the sort of thing. The Fed knows something that everyone else doesn't in terms of the economy. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure they get access to some data that you know normal punters don't see. But they've never really often behave in a way that's completely antithetical to what people expect, you know, that, that would suggest that they constantly have, or they always have information that other people aren't privy to. So I don't I don't necessarily think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of speculation that could be politically motivated, um, you know, in an election year next year. Um, of course, that would make sense, but we'll never know. And and I think it's kind of like it's, it's kind of there's not much point in speculating in that. I, I think follow the money. Um, um, and at the end of the day, politics is driven by what the economy is going to do and ultimately, you know, what markets are doing. And that's kind of driven by liquidity. So I think if you follow the money, you'll manage to get the most of the motivations you need to. And following the money tells me that if they don't, if they didn't do anything and they allow um, interest rates to keep rising. And remember, by the time what really kind of uh, unnerved them was term premiums start rising. And um, so basically longer term yields started to rise, even though mm -hmm. they weren't doing anything at the front end. So the, the, the curve steepened, bear steepened, and term premiums started to rise. And they obviously brought that up. And so therefore, that really is a problem for the government's borrowing bill, um, and therefore for liquidity and therefore for financial stability, uh, especially, by the way, as it relates to funding markets. So we had that little flare up in the SOFA rate a couple of weeks ago. 
that's something they really want to avoid too. Because if we have a, a blow up in the funding markets, which is caused by too few reserves, um, that's a major issue because that that's that really kicks in uh, financial stability and markets and causes a lot of problems. So all these things, I think, are um, they're definitely concerns. Um, and having that interest rate bill ballooning, and it really was ballooning, um, is something they could do something about by 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 lowering uh, long end yields. And they took a punt, obviously, that they think inflation is not going to be an issue. Okay, so back to liquidity being, you know, follow your point about following the money. Um, what is your liquidity outlook for next year? So right now, I mean, uh, to the I. Excess liquidity is one of the things I, I followed. Now, that looked as if it might start to roll, roll over. So one of the few things that sort of leads excess liquidity itself, excess liquidity tends to lead stuff. So if you look at like annual returns of risk assets like stocks, um, you know, oil, things like that, excess liquidity tends to lead it based on the arguments, you know, I made before about it being liquidity that's excess and tends to find its way into to assets. Um, but the real yield curve, uh, tends to lead excess liquidity. Now that looked like it started to to roll over, um, as in it started to steepen. <clears throat> um, but the Fed's actions have now just caused the reversal on that. So I, I think the excess liquidity was on the cusp um, of declining and beginning to decline, and that would sort of overall make liquidity conditions less conducive, less friendly, um, for risk assets. But the the Fed's uh, pivot has just has just kind of reversed that. Um, so this this the dollar has weakened again, and I think that's really, as I say, that's been a big positive um, for liquidity conditions this year. Um, it started to rally quite recently, but you know the Fed's reversal has caused it to decline again. So kind of it's all all systems are kind of green for now. Um, you know that could change in in, in a few months, but uh, the outlook for the next few months I think is liquidity tailwinds, and it will continue to mean that risk assets. It's kind of hard for them to go down. It's not necessarily like, you know, they can't go down. Of course, they can go down if something happens, but you have this kind of like support. Um, and with that support, it's kind of hard for them to to really sell off a huge amount and, and they'll just grind higher uh, in the absence of anything negative. All right. Well, let me um, let me share that I, I interviewed um, Felix Zuloff two weeks ago or so, and this was this was pre the, the Fed surprise. And his his outlook... Uh, he said, "Look, I think I think asset prices are going to continue rallying from here, all the way through Q1, and the economy is going to look stronger to folks. And we're going to get this narrative of the Fed's achieved the impossible. You know, we have the no landing scenario. Everything is great again. Everybody's making lots of money in the markets again. And then he sort of sees the wheels coming off, and um, the market." The S and P potentially, from whatever new high it's trading at at the end of Q1, could go down by as much as forty percent. He's not saying that's going to happen, but he's just saying the potential is there. Um, I know you've got concerns about the second half of the year economically. How does that potential trajectory seem to you, given your outlook for markets right now? Is that a do you see a similar kind of up and down? Do you see something different? So the uh, exogenous, sorry, endogenously, like obviously exogenously, if something happens, then, you know, so that, yeah, that uprooms everything. But looking at the market um, itself, uh, as I say, I think the biggest risk, like it's not black swan, of course, um, it's known, unknown, but inflation coming back. Um, and I think that that might take the second half of the year before you've got a chance of seeing that. And that would cause... Uh, the Fed's reaction function to change because say its reaction function has now changed again. So you, you can't, you know, I think what applied a couple of weeks ago doesn't necessarily apply now. Um, and I think they are more gung ho about uh, allowing kind of animal spirits to to reign for for the time being, uh, as far as as long as they think inflation um, is not returning. So so that will keep the game in play um, for now. So Q, I wouldn't think Q1. I don't see there's nothing I'm looking at that would tell me Q1, but there are stuff things that I'm looking at that maybe tells me Q3 or Q4 um, for that sort of dynamic to take place. Because it's, as I say, as long as liquidity conditions um, are as they are right now, <clears throat> and as I say, the power pivot has bought more time, um, then that should keep risk assets kind of, they're not necessarily going to fly higher, but they really just have got such a, a, a friendly tailwind 
um, that it means that the the you know as I say unless you have uh, anything particularly negative happening from another angle, um, they should keep grinding hard. The other kind of endogenous risk, but you know an unknown if you like, would be something happening in credit markets. Um, so credit markets have been another thing that's benefited from you know, this kind of like easier financial, they're part of financial conditions, of course, but, you know, the general kind of like good liquidity backdrop from reserves, you know, credit spreads have kept coming in, even though, you know, credit fundamentals have been deteriorating, charge off rates have been rising, banks have been tightening lending standards, all the usual things that tend to lead to credit cycle had been deteriorating. Some of them have actually started to turn back up a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at, as I say, the underlying stuff, uh, bankruptcy filings, for instance, were, were rising. You know, these are things I think we've got to watch for that suggest that maybe credit spreads are not necessarily reflective of the true health of the credit market. And 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 then you've got to add in the opacity of the private credit market too. Um, you know, that that's now massive. It's like one and a half trillion dollars in the US. Uh, there we don't have price discovery. Uh, so I think that I, you know, would be a little bit wary of making any predictions about a market that's even more opaque than it than it maybe was before. Um, so if you had something happening in credit, and the thing is about credit is the, in terms of feeding through to the economy, like markets and economy kind of feed off on another. You try, you get recessions basically when you get negative feedback loops between markets and the economy. So, you know, the economy maybe shows that it's getting weaker. Markets respond to that. So markets get weaker, but then that feeds back into the economy and the economy gets weaker again and you have a negative feedback loop. And if it cascades past a certain point, you tend to get a recession, but the the high the, the thing that's the biggest accelerant of that, if you like, is credit spreads. They're the sort of strongest link between the economy and markets. So that's why I would be kind of I'm concerned about something happening in credit markets because I think that could quickly take us into recessionary territory. Um, other than, as I say, other exogenous things. Um, All right, and and what do you think are the biggest uh, the biggest risks that could manifest in trouble in the credit market? I, is it the lag effect where we just have you know, the longer we have rates high relative to where they were a few years back, we just start seeing more participants start to struggle either because corporate balance sheets re-rate or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's the growing interest rate burden. So as we had the chart earlier, they, they've kind of, on, in the aggregate, they've benefited so far. So that will start to bite. So is that reversal <clears throat> yeah, that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. that reversal. There's the what you alluded to. There's the the, uh, the maturity wall. So that will incrementally have more of an issue um, as, as they have to roll over the debt. Um, and as I say, I think the, what's happening in, in private credit markets, you know, I mean, there's all kind of stuff that sounds crazy to me. I'm sure it makes sense if you're in the market, but NAD loans and using insurance premiums to 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 lend to to people. Um, and we know that credit, whenever you see uh, a swelling in credit, whether it's bank credit or private credit or the credit markets, it's very hard to make a lot of loans quickly without some of these loans um, being bad loans, you know, lending to the wrong people. Um, you know, before the pandemic and stuff, we had, you know, all, all the, the covenant light loans, everything that's kind of orientated around the borrower, not the lender. Um, and that just creates overall bad lending and lending that's likely to sour. And if there's too much of it, obviously, it can create uh, an issue that can um, mushroom pretty quickly. So, yeah, I, I have I have sort of concerns there. Um, I, I just don't necessarily think credit spreads on their own are really as reflective of the true health of the credit market as perhaps they once were. Got it. Got it. And when you talk about problems mushrooming too, it's it's important to remind folks that there's counterparty risk in credit markets, right? And especially in, when when there's greater opacity, like there is in private credit, like you said, you know, sometimes there's a player that goes down that you don't realize the dominoes that that one failure begins to set off. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And as I say that, and and it very quickly feeds into the economy, um, and, and you have a, a situation where you have like what looks like a fairly kind of stable economy, like growing okay, can very quickly go south. And that, that's often what happens in recessions. They, they, they don't happen gradually, they happen suddenly. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, look, I, I could keep going for hours longer here, Simon, and there's lots of questions I didn't get to, which means we're just going to have to have you back on in early 2024. And hopefully you'll have a little bit more, you know, data by then to sort of see where you think that the year may be going. But, but given your your current outlook, um, which again, I'll just sort of summarize and feel free to, to correct it, is um, 
lots of lots of tailwind right now at the market sales, at least for the the, the next couple of months or so. Um, and then um, you get more worried as the year goes on. Um, certainly back after the year, it definitely has some pretty stiff challenges that could turn into market headwinds. What what assets right now do you think will fare? I mean, it seems like all assets pretty much are doing well right now. Are we going to have all assets do well uh, up, up until the momentum stops and then looking for your second half of the year? How would you consider folks, you know, or think folks should consider positioning given what could happen then? Um, yeah, it's a good, uh, good question. I mean, I think uh, to some extent, yeah, I think look, we're back in kind of everything rally, rally territory. Um, the things that maybe you want to look at now are the things that aren't participating. And unless you can find a really good reason as to why they're not, they might be good candidates. So, you know, potentially, you know, oil. I mean, oil has thus far not really participated much, but as the Red Sea thing has just reminded us, you know, that there's, there's constant risks to oil. Um, people have been very negative negative on it for a while. Um, so these sort of things, whereas it's it's kind of hard to buy the S and P at all time highs. Um, that's not to say, of course, like it goes through an all time high and there's a uh, FOMO kicks in and it keeps on rallying. But it depends how you want to trade. I mean, some people don't mind that. Other people just hate buying at the highs. It just feels, you know, it feels like it's too risky. Um, so, but I think you broadly characterized it right in in terms of you know uh, I, I, another laggard, by the way, is EM, and I, I guess that's been held back by by China. Um, you know, China again is another one. I mean, neg sentiment is is so negative. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of bad news already in the price. Uh, it, you know, unless you think China's going to have a deflationary bust, some people do. Um, you know, I just don't think we're quite there yet. And so, at some point, I think it, you know, it start the risk reward in something like China equity starts to look good. And they they're by the way pumping liquidity in the system at an ever increasing rate. If you look at net injections from the PBOC, they're on a 12 month basis, they're at like multi year highs. So, you know, they are incrementally easing more and more and more um, behind the scenes, plus all the other targeted kind of stimulus that they're they're adding. So Ch China, I think at some point, I think next year um, will recover. And um, and then the second half of the year, yeah, I think the things that you are looking to kind of either get rid of or short are things that obviously <clears throat> have gone up the most, but I'd say, you, because I think inflation is going to come back, I think anything that looks like it's this duration risk, um, you know, again, the market traded kind of the inflation risk thing at the very beginning, like in, um, I think, late 2021, uh, you know, when inflation was rising or 2021, people were shunning kind of tech shares um, and sort of looking at lower duration stocks like utilities. So really it kind of, that point, it kind of made a lot of sense, but then, you know, I guess the end of 2022, especially when chat GPT three and a half was released, uh, that all got jettisoned uh, and it became like just grab for duration. Um, and obviously inflation's not going to be an issue. So, you know, who cares? Um, uh, so I think then that that could reverse again. You know, I think people might start to be, if, if it looks like inflation's coming back and no one's ready for it, people might start to reevaluate their attitude to duration again, not not just in stocks, obviously, and fixed in income. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, this has been a, a just a wonderful discussion. Thanks for giving us so much of your time. Um, I've got two more questions for you. The second one, uh, which we'll end with, is going to be, you know, we've been talking about monetary and financially related issues this whole hour. Um, uh, you just gave us a good sense of of, of assets to, to go investigate, given, you know, the, the potential outlook of how things could happen next year. But is there a a non-financial um, investment that you would encourage people to consider adopting in their lives, no matter how much money they might have in their portfolio, a lot or a little? Um, before I get to that question, though, very important question for folks that have really enjoyed this discussion. Maybe this is their first time meeting you uh, virtually and would like to follow you and your work. How can they do that? So I write on, on Bloomberg. So I'm a macro strategist on, on Bloomberg. So I write I have a column uh, called Macroscope. Um, which you can find, you know, on, on the Bloomberg terminal, and also I write for the um, the Markets Live blog. Um, so it's a, a twenty four hour kind of scroll um, of market news. Um, lots of contributors, um, and that also is on the on the on the terminal too. So they're they're the best places um, to find to find my writing. Okay, great. When I edit this, 
Simon, I will put up links to those uh, or the, the URLs for those on the screen. Folks, I'll put links down in the description uh, below the video too. And also too, if you just go to, you know, internet and just search Simon White Bloomberg, you'll get a lot of news coverage of a lot of Simon's analysis where, you know, a lot of journalists are reading his reports and then sort of, you know, incorporating them into their writing. So um, fantastic. All right. Well, really quickly and just uh, wrapping up here, quick, quick housekeeping before we get to our last question. One, if you've enjoyed meeting Simon here, we'd like to have him come on in early 2024 and give us an update to his outlook. Please encourage him to do that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon. And just a reminder, while this new Thoughtful Money channel is still in its infancy, the growth in our subscribers on this channel really does make a big difference in getting the YouTube algorithm to pick us up. So it's totally free to subscribe. If you can do that, that is great. Um, secondly, um, just want to remind folks that I am now resumed publishing my Adams notes, which are my Cliff Notes summaries to these interviews. Um, if you want to get all the ones that I've done for every uh, expert that I've interviewed on this channel so far, plus my one from this interview here with Simon, uh, just go to my Substack adamtaggart.substack.com. I have a lot of information there for free, though to get the notes, uh, you have to subscribe uh, for the premium service, which which is still pretty darn cheap. It's it's still gonna be $8 a month through the end of this month. So if you're interested in getting them, get them soon before the price goes up. Um, and then last, we're at this question, Simon, um, what, what what's a non-financial investment you'd encourage folks to consider? So something I've done in the past and then have neglected recently, but I think it's even more um, appropriate now uh, is uh, is learn as much as you can about programming and about AI, uh, because it's obviously it's a cliche, but it is the future. Um, but there's a book I read uh, by a guy called Douglas uh, Rushkoff a few years ago. It's called Program or Be Programmed, um, and I think that really kind of captures exactly the kind of sentiment here. Is that if I guess you you don't know about what exactly what's happening, is you essentially allow your life to be directed by tech or if you don't it means you allow your life to be directed by others who've mastered tech or tech itself um uh, you know one choice the first one you get you know access to the control panel of your life um and the second one i think you know maybe one of the last sort of proper decisions that you ever make uh so i think it's so important now you know just not to be a consumer of tech to actually have some inkling about what is happening behind it so that you you know you you have some autonomy left because I think it's just going to get more and more kind of confusing and the more confusing it the less you know about it the more confusing it will be so that would be my that be my suggestion for a non financial investment that is a fantastic answer um, God, I love this question I'm just getting so many great answers that I, I never would have predicted uh, but this is a, this is truly just a I mean a, almost an essential one I think given the new era that we're entering into. Um, so Simon and folks watching, I will put a link down to Douglas Rushkoff's book in the description as well. So if you want to go check that out, you, you can do that at just one click. And it's very Simon, short, pretty short as well. It's pretty short. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, um, all right. Well, look, Simon, again, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. It's been, uh, even better than I, than I'd hoped it was going to be. So thank you so much. Um, the, uh, door is always open here to come back on this channel when you, you have, you know, an important shift in, in your outlook. Um, but hopefully at the latest, we'll get you back in early 2024 for that. Um, folks, if you want to continue to, to investigate the topic of liquidity, which you know is central to how Simon sees the world, if you did not see the Michael Howell video, I'll put up a link to it right here. And if you still got some stamina, you can go watch that one. Simon, again, thank you so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.